If you have your Bibles this afternoon and you would join me in the 18th chapter of the book of Luke. Luke the physician, chapter 18. Beginning at verse 18 as well and reading through verse number 27. I want to talk to us today on the topic, one size does not fit all. Amen. If you look at my sermon illustration today, you see that is a tag in an actual garment that actually reads, one size does not fit all. Amen. Luke chapter 18, 18 through 27 in the King James text today reads, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, Jesus said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you bow your heads with me a moment. Master, once again, the bread of life is broken for the benefit of your people. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. The word of God provides for us nourishment. It strengthens us. It encourages us. It gives us what we need to continue this journey. Oh, Master, today how we need the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the church of the living God. How we need men and women to stand in the pulpit and preach under that great divine anointing. For, Lord, the church has never lacked a word from God as it lacks a word from God today surely there is a drought in the land there is a famine in the land and there is a thirst for water the word of god declaring not a not a, a drought of food not a, a a lack of water but rather of the hearing of the word of god and without the hearing of the word of god there can be no faith inspired in the heart of God's people for faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God anoint your speaker today help me Lord to deliver the word from the Lord that you've given me for your church at this hour let every word be sweetened by the presence of the Holy Ghost and let every hearer be conditioned in heart and in mind to receive, Lord, today that which I'm about to deliver. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. 
Amen. Praise God. And amen. Praise the name of the Lord. It is imperative today that we take note of the fact that during the Lord's earthly ministry, it's amazing how many churches, evangelical and fundamentalist churches, they get this all wrong. This is something I had to learn, something I've had to remind myself of as I study and read the Word of God because it is something that we can quickly and easily lose sight of and yet it is integral to understanding the proper uh, interpretation and understanding especially of the Gospels. It's important to note that during the Lord's earthly ministry listen carefully the law of Moses was yet in effect the law of Moses did not expire with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ it did not expire with the child in the manger in the little town of Bethlehem the dominance of the law did not come to a close. Listen carefully, saints, this is important. Until the moment that the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Many want to believe that when the Lord declared on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Many want to believe that it is at that moment that the gospel of Jesus Christ took effect. And all of a sudden at that moment there was a transition from the law of Moses to the gospel of grace. But that is not true. The Apostle Paul reminds us that the gospel of Jesus Christ hinges upon two things. He said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, listen, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Without the resurrection, the death would have been worthless. Without the resurrection, his death would have meant nothing. Child of God, I'm here to tell you today, it is not enough to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for your sin, but you must also believe with all of your heart that he rose from the dead, hallelujah, bringing to us and for us victory over sin's final penalty. Glory to God. So until the Lord rose from the dead, the law of Moses was in full effect. It was impossible for any man, woman, boy, or girl to be saved prior to the resurrection. There are some that teach that the third man on the cross, the th or the second man on the cross next to the Lord Jesus Christ, who asked the Lord to be remembered when he came into his kingdom, Many teach in fundamentalist and evangelical circles. I'm going to say it plain because I don't know how to. Mix, I'm not interested in mixing words. They preach a lie. They preach that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, offered that man salvation on the cross when he said, "Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise." I'm here to tell you, it was not possible for the thief on the cross to be saved. It was impossible for the thief to be saved. Why? 
Jesus had not further, he hadn't even died yet, never mind having risen from the dead. To be saved, there must be faith in his death, his burial, most importantly, his resurrection. Interestingly enough, there are some theological points which can be made concerning that specific story. One of those points being this. In the Greek, in the, in the language the New Testament was written, there is no punctuation. Any punctuation you see is inserted by the translators. Because in English we use punctuation to kind of uh, frame thoughts and frame, you know, the direction our sentence is going in. But in the original text there was no, there is no punctuation. And the reality is that within Hebrew uh, style, linguistics, when a speaker or a teacher would often say, Today, thus and so, what they were doing was they were emphasizing what they were saying. They were not declaring, listen carefully to me now, they were not declaring that what they were about to say was going to happen today. The word of God said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Do you see? It, it is a linguistic style that is used by the writer, by the speaker. So what the Lord was saying, if you were to simply change the location of one comma, Instead of the Lord saying, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, he would have said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Meaning, I'm establishing this as a fact in the here and now. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That is how they would use the term today. Okay, especially when they would preclude it with verily, verily, I say unto thee or something of that nature. Okay, that's just one point. The other point is the Lord said today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Um, he couldn't have been speaking of heaven because anybody who knows anything about the word of God knows the word of God said before he descended, he first what? ascended. Before he went up, he first went down. Hallelujah. And the word of God teaches his three days in the grave were devoted to preaching, this is what scripture says, to the spirits which were in prison. Meaning those Jews, those believing Jews who were in the presence of Abraham, they were in a holding place referred to as Abraham's bosom. Those believing Jews who were in Abraham's bosom, remember the story of the rich man who died and found himself in hell and the beggar Lazarus who died. And where was Lazarus in Abraham's bosom? Bosom. He was not in heaven. He was not in glory. He was in Abraham's bosom. Jesus went to that place referred to as Abraham's bosom. Paradise literally meaning a garden or a holding place or a room. So literally it was a portion and a part of of Hades. It was part of hell. But it was not a place of torment, but rather it was a place of waiting. They were in holding. Listen, if you've ever been in a hospital, and or if you've ever known somebody who's been in a hospital for mental health issues, and they have to be in a ward that is secure, the doors are locked, they cannot freely come and go as they would wish. They are not confined to a jail cell. They're not chained to the wall. They're not handcuffed and shackled. But still, 
though they are unable to come and go at will because the entrance and the exit from that ward or from that hospital are, are guarded and locked. If you've ever been to visit someone, you know, in a place like that, then you understand that uneasiness and the awkwardness of feeling like you are captive to a place and you don't have the freedom to come and go. Therefore, even though these who were in Abraham's bosom, who were in paradise, who were in a garden, a room, a waiting place, it was still part of hell. They therefore were still captive. They were still unable to come and go freely. But the word of God declares that at the moment of the Lord's resurrection, <laughs> it says he led captivity captive. Hallelujah. He opened the door. He opened the gate. Glory to God. So that those who were in Abraham's bosom could now ascend to the presence of God. Hallelujah. And they could enjoy the glories of heaven. be kind of dopey for Jesus to say I'm going to be with you somewhere today but I'm not going there today I'll see you in three days how much sense does that make after his resurrection his meeting with Mary what did he say to Mary he said don't touch me why I have not yet ascended unto the father honey he hadn't been to glory yet so to suggest that the thief on the cross was saved is pure theological garbage. And we need to be more studious. We need to be more careful in how we read and how we uh, interpret what is written in the word of God. Amen. So it's important to understand that the law of Moses was in full effect until the moment of the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection. It was at that moment he shattered the mandates and edicts of the law and established in its place a covenant of grace accessed by faith. So with this in mind, we must read the story we have read today with a broader scope and glean from it a wider lesson than simply, quote, which rules need I follow to make it into heaven? No, that's, that's not what we're supposed to get from this passage I read to you today. The key to this particular passage is actually found more, listen carefully, more in the rich man's question than even the master's response. Did you hear me now? The key to this particular passage is more found in the rich man's question than the master's response. The inquiry consisted of this wealthy man's asking, listen carefully, quote, what shall I do? He did not ask, what must we do? He asked only, what must I do? This exact story is shared in three of the four Gospels. And in each recording, the inquiry is worded the same. What shall I do? Mark 10, 17 through 22. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? That I may inherit eternal life. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. 
Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. That was Mark's version of Luke 18, 18 through 27. Matthew records it, and uh, Matthew 19, 16 through 22, and the whole one came and said unto him, Good master, listen, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Remember, the law of Moses was yet in effect at this time. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, meaning mature or complete, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. We see then that in three of the four Gospels, the same meeting, the same account is shared with us by three of the four Gospel writers. And in all three of the accounts, the man's question is framed every time exactly the same way. Interestingly enough, the Lord's answer is not framed exactly the same way. It's the same basic answer, of course. But if you notice, each of the writers added one thing or, or changed something. But they still gave points of the law, you know, uh, out of the Ten Commandments, right? So, three of the Gospels record this man as asking, What shall I do? Two. This man understood something that Christians today under grace through faith don't even get. And here this fellow was under the law of Moses and he still understood something we don't get. What is that? Salvation is a personal experience. It's not always about generalized rules. It's not always about what I must do, you must do. What you must do, I must do. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I hope somebody's listening to me today. One size does not fit all. On the day of Pentecost, a far broader question was asked. And then answered by Peter in Acts 2, 37 through 39. Now when they heard this, those who had gathered at Jerusalem for the celebration of Pentecost, when they heard the apostles and Peter preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, having just received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the upper room, they were pricked in their heart, the hearers, were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, listen, what shall we do? Hallelujah. Oh, if you want to know what you got to do to be saved, the answer is universal. It is not one thing for one and something else 
for the other. No, no, no. The gospel, our response to the gospel, God's personally prescribed answer and response to the gospel is universal. And it is this. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall, not you might, you may, you could, but ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. There is one universal call to the whole of humanity in response to the query, what must we do to be saved? And Peter eloquently and without ambiguity answered that sincere cry for instruction. One of the key factors of the law delivered by the Lord to Moses on Mount Sinai lie in the fact that it was very rigid, very ungiving, very inflexible. Within the context of the law, the same rules, every single one of them, applied to everyone within the Jewish nation exactly the same. The problem with this approach is that it allows, listen to me children, it allows no room for grace. Grace breaks through the rigidity of universal law and brings the application of rules and regulations down to a very personal level. In Romans 9.15, the Apostle Paul writes, for he saith to Moses, speaking of Jehovah God, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Understanding this, we must be willing to accept that one may share offense in glory with another who did something that we were not given the liberty to do. Did you hear what I just said? In heaven, when you go out to mow your lawn, you may be mowing your lawn right up against the neighbor, and that neighbor in this life was permitted by God. Oh, I hope you're listening to me, children, because this about makes me want to shout. You may be mowing your lawn next to a neighbor who God allowed to do things you were not allowed to do. Or who was not allowed and permitted things that you were allowed and permitted to do. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Why? Because that's the nature of grace. God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion. Whoever I choose, wherever I choose to exercise compassion. God judges righteous judgment. We judge by the conduct. God sees far deeper. He knows what's going on in the heart of man. Got news for you, you homophobic fundamentalist. God knows why that individual is gay or lesbian. You think you know, but God doesn't think he knows. He knows! Right. And when you wind up in glory with a gay neighbor, don't be surprised. <laughs> glory to God. Not every child is bound by the same rules in any given household. An older child may be allowed to stay out until 11 or 12 o'clock at night, whereas a younger child is required to be uh, 
to be in the house by 7 p.m. One is capable of greater responsibility, yet with that greater responsibility also comes greater accountability. So LGBT believer, don't think just because you've come to understand the grace of God works for you, that all of a sudden the rules are different for you than for a non-LGBT believer. No, 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 we're all called to live godly lives. We're all called to live moral lives. We're all called to be light in darkness. You can't live like the world and expect to be a light. Hello now, no. Light is as opposite to darkness as what? Light is to black. Therefore, a believer most certainly lives differently than the unbeliever. And don't you think just because God said you can come in at midnight rather than seven that you escape accountability? Do you follow what I'm telling you now? No, no, no. No, with greater responsibility comes greater accountability. I'm going to tell you, Galatians 5, 13 through 16, for brethren, Paul writes, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So Paul said, don't use your liberty as an occasion to act the fool. Okay? Because why? Because the more you are extended privilege, the more responsibility you also will bear in the end. Some children will use their parents' trust as a license to engage in activities of which their parents would not approve. Others will appreciate the confidence mom and dad have bestowed upon them and strive to honor that trust by behaving Responsibly, Am I telling the truth today? My parents allowed me to get my driver's license on my 16th birthday. Whereas my younger brother was not able to do so until he turned 18. He was far less responsible and much more careless and reckless and individual than I. So they set different standards for each of us. That makes sense, doesn't it? Amen. You see, we live in a society today where we have so many things that are standardized. We have standardized testing. We have standardized teaching methods, right? Schools do things the same way for all students. And yet in, in my lifetime, there's been a major movement within uh, schooling and teaching, uh, even in colleges and universities. There's been a major movement as educators have come to realize, listen carefully, one size does not fit all. You cannot teach effectively every student in your school using the same identical method. No, that method may work beautifully with a child who is brilliant, but it will not work well with a child who struggles. Or vice versa. It may work beautifully for the child who struggles, but it may bore silly the student who is not struggling. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my, and many of you, I imagine, have experienced the same thing. My mother was constantly being told by my teachers as I was growing up through grammar school and middle school, well, you know, Chuck is a comedian. He's a class clown. He uh, loves to get the class all laughing and jovial. And then the teacher would say, and the reason for this is, he is bored out of his mind. Our curriculum does not keep up with him. He 
is past it the minute he hears it and therefore he just loses interest in the rest of everything so therefore he turns on the clown and goofs around the teachers understood what the problem was I tried to take piano lessons many years ago. I, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do it very long. But uh, I had a piano teacher come to my house, and she told me, she said, do you know that each time I come and give you a lesson, she said, I'm literally giving you three lessons at a clip. She said, because you're like a sponge. You just soak it all up. She said, said, if I were to try to give you one lesson and have you work on that till next week, she said, you'd become so bored and you, you wouldn't want to pursue it any further. Unfortunately, I ran out of money before I ran out of interest. <laughs> but do you follow what I'm trying to say today? One size does not fit all. And yet people want to frame the gospel of Jesus Christ as though it shares, uh, it shares in common with the law of Moses, this rigidity and this universal application. But the word of God teaches us differently. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Many Christians want to believe that God's grace is based upon an endless well of love which can be taken advantage of and taken for granted. They say, well, since God is so much a dispenser of grace, I can do as I please, and all will be well. The only problem with this thinking lies in the fact that once betrayed, any reasonable parent, listen carefully now, will tighten the noose. <laughs> no. Once mom and dad know you disappointed them, they gave you room, I let you stay out till 11 and you come home drunk. I let you stay out till 11 and you come home high. I let you stay out till 11 and you wreck the car. Well, guess what? Now what happens? Now the new system. I want you in the house by 9. From now on, I want you home by 9. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. Okay. So, uh... 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, the Apostle Paul writes, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient or necessary. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So Paul says, as far as the law is concerned, I am not restricted from doing anything. Why? Because the law is no longer in effect. I'm now under grace. He said, but by the same token, I know that it is my responsibility to make certain that I do not allow anything to control me. I don't allow anything to get such a hold in my life that instead of my yielding and surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I am yielding and surrendering to addiction. I am yielding and surrendering to weakness. I am yielding and surrendering to sin. Do you understand? say what I'm telling you today. 1 Corinthians 10, 22 and 23. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So in the first passage, Paul said, everything's lawful for me, but 
That doesn't mean that it's necessary for me either. It doesn't mean it's good for me. It doesn't mean that I need to be bothered with it. Amen. Do I believe somebody goes to hell if they take a drink? No. But do I drink? No. I choose not to drink alcohol. I choose not to imbibe. Why? Because I'm going to go to hell if I do? No. But because I understand that alcohol can be addictive. I understand that many people fall under its power, fall under its sway, become addicted. They allow it to control them and to manipulate them. They fall under the power of it. You hear what I'm telling you now? What then is the easiest, simple way to make certain that that never happens to me? I avoid it altogether. It's pretty easy. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Amen. In Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 14, the Apostle Paul writes, Him that is weak in the flesh, excuse me, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. What business is, is it of yours? How my maid cleans my kitchen. That's what Paul's saying. How, how are you going to sit in judgment of another man's servant? Got news for you, honey. There ain't a person in the church that's my servant. There's not a person in the church that's your servant. No, no, no. Every one of us are servants of God. And whether we're doing a good job, job or a bad job, by your estimation, it's none of your business. That's what Paul just said. Hmm. Who are you to judge another man's servant? No, God's able to make him stand. How? I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. Hello now. I will have compassion upon whom I will have compassion. God's able to make him stand. The Lord may well accept that person right where they're at. The Lord may accept that person weaknesses and all. The Lord may accept that person in the condition they're in. Hello now. Would he accept you if you were to turn around and do the same thing? No, because your situation is not the same as that person's situation. You may not have had the same upbringing that person have had. You may not have had the same circumstances that that person is living in. You may not have had the same influences in your life that that person has had. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. He said, one man esteemeth one day above another, Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man, listen, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. One size does not fit all. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind never ceases to amaze me how people that call themselves Christians will go out of their way to try to dissuade an LGBT believer from going to church and trying to serve the Lord. Mm. One famous television preacher, I'll not name him by name, but he recently, well, a couple years ago, actually came out with a statement. He was being interviewed, and he said, I understand that there's actually a movement out there where LGBT people are actually uh, creating churches because they love the Lord and they want to serve God, and they're going to church, and they're doing their best to live for the Lord. He said, now, I may not agree with their theology. I may not agree with everything they, they believe. He said, but... I think they ought to have every right to do that. I think if they want to build churches and they want to try to live for God, let them do it. And do you know that man got hell to pay for making that statement? People called him a heretic. 
People called him every name under the sun because he made that statement. Listen, if a bunch of Satanists walked in this door and said, we want to worship the God of heaven. We want to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Honey, I'm not going to stop them. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. My God, what's wrong with the church today? I'll tell you what's wrong. They embrace the mentality one size fits all. No, the rules that apply to me apply to you as well. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's not what Paul said. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us live to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself himself to God sounds very personal let us not therefore judge one another anymore but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way that is exactly what these ignoramuses do when they try to tell an lgbt person you can't be a child of god you shouldn't even be trying to go to church you shouldn't even be trying to live for god you're on satan's payroll mm -hmm. and don't you fool yourself don't you deceive yourself into thinking any different you are on the enemy's payroll you're placing a stumbling block in front of someone you don't have to agree with where they're at. You don't have to agree with their walk with God. But honey, you are in no position to judge God's servant. He's the one who determines whether or not they're meeting his standard. And his standard for them may not be his standard for you. Amen. Yes, the message of salvation is universal. To be saved, there is one answer. Hallelujah. Acts 2, 38 and 39. But beyond that, every individual's walk with God is unique and personal. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Then Paul said, verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. Who persuaded him? The Lord Jesus. What did he persuade him of? Listen, that there is nothing, listen to the word Paul uses, that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him, to him, to him it is unclean. What did Paul just say? I'll tell you what he just said. One size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. Am I telling the truth today? Man, I wish I had a church full of Holy Ghost filled people so I could hear somebody shouting amen. 
Many people want to believe that our God will judge solely on the merits of our actions, not taking it all into account the motivations or the choices behind those actions. Will a woman who shoots her husband dead because she found him molesting her grandchild be found a murderer by the Lord because she killed? Or will her motivation to protect and defend her innocent grandchild trigger the Master's grace? And allow her to enter heaven. Listen to me carefully. Although technically a murderer. Say, Pastor, that's a crazy scenario. That You just pulled that out of thin air. I got news for you. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I know a Pentecostal lady who experienced this exact thing. In later life, she married a man. Apparently she didn't know him as well as she thought she did. And one night she came in on him literally sexually molesting her granddaughter. This lady was a precious saint of God. She was a very precious saint of God. She told him to stop. He told her, get out of the room. Leave me alone. Can you imagine? She went, retrieved a pistol that he had in the house. She brought it in the room. She pointed at him and said, leave her alone. He said, get out. You're not going to shoot me with that thing. And he continued doing what he was doing. She shot him. Here to tell you folks, life's a lot more complicated than these ignoramuses in the fundamentalist and evangelical camp want you to think. Human sexuality and, and gender identification are a whole lot more complicated than these morons want you to think. And I've got news for you. I've got good news for you today. One size does not fit all. God understands you. He understands why you are who you are. He understands why you do what you do. If nobody else on this planet does, He does. And he has made it abundantly clear. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Oh, honey, I'm here to tell you, if you exercise faith in the gospel, if you obey the gospel, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you obey this gospel, honey, there is no way in God's green earth you're going to tell me that God will not honor you. I ask the question today, will one who engages in certain conduct be barred from heaven? Because, listen to me, they believed they had no choice in the matter? Or will they share the same fate as one who specifically chooses to engage in that same conduct? Although... It was not anything they believed to be innate to their character or natural for themselves. Let's get more specific. An LGBT person who absolutely believes I've been this way, I've felt this ever since I was a kid, it is as natural to me as sneezing. Is that person going to be held by God to the same standard, listen to me now, as a prisoner in a jail who engages in same-sex sexual encounters simply because there's not a female convenient? It's not natural to them, has nothing to do with what is innate, has nothing to do with what is natural for them, but they choose to do it because they don't have a member of the opposite gender available. And if that person gets out of jail, guess what they do? They go find their wife, they go find their girlfriend, and they're right back to their heterosexual life because it had nothing to do with them being homosexual under any circumstance. Am I telling the truth today? See, think about it today. One size does not fit all. I'm trying to close up today. 
In the end, our journey in the Lord is a very personal journey. Instead of always looking at the individual beside us and trying to judge whether or not they're living up to God's standard, we ought to always be looking inward and striving to make certain we are pleasing Daddy in our own conduct, in our own behavior. And so long as we are living an unselfish life, loving our neighbor as ourselves, my Lord, the Lord will surely be pleased. Isn't that what the apostle taught us? Matthew 22, 35 through 40, my last passage today. Then one of them which was a lawyer asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment of, in the law? Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the most powerful words in the word of God are these. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Those who embrace a legalistic mindset cannot even fathom the doctrine of grace. Grace is for them weakness and incomprehensible. But the belief that all things apply equally to all across the board without flexibility or room to consider the specifics of the situation contradicts the Gospels, the teachings of Christ, the instruction of the Apostles, and the simple truths of grace and salvation by faith. In the end, the most important truth a believer today can grasp is this. One size does not fit all. Amen. Praise the Lord. Isn't that good news today? Yeah. I have to put this up real fast at the end. I'll have to find a way to share this on uh, on YouTube or something. I happened to find this little cartoon as I was looking for a sermon illustration this week. And here you see three, four uh, critters, an elephant, uh, an ostrich, a turtle, and a snake looking in the window of a store. And on the window of the store it says, One size fits all. Now imagine an elephant, an ostrich, a snake, and a turtle. Is it possible that anything could be made so that one size fits all of them? No, absolutely not. One size does not fit all. Amen.